want to tell you a little bit about Ron. Uh, I've been on the road for probably about seven years. For about four of those, uh, I worked with this, this woman, Nancy Ryan. Nancy and I, for about a year, were listening to the same Ron Shock CD over and over and just about pissing ourselves on the road. When you read on the flyer, legendary comic, ladies and gentlemen, that's not advertising. <laughs> this guy, ask any comic working today, they got a shock story. He's been doing it for a very long time. He was uh, the last of the new comics to appear on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. The Las Vegas Review calls him the best American storyteller since Will Rogers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage. Very good friend, I hope, for many years to come. I want him to kick ass here at Comedy in the Park. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Shock. You know, I've played all over the country, literally all over the world. I uh, uh, am glad to be here. This is going to be a fun gig. On the directions to here, they said, drive down this road until you get to the service station. <laughs> not, not a brand name, no, not a shell station, the, the service station, and it's across the street. <laughs> that was my directions to the gig. <laughs> One time I played a military base in northern Michigan at an NCO club, and when I get there, the sign said, Chicken Dinner and Ron Shock. Five dollars. <laughs> a low price ticket, and I got second billing to a chicken. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I'm playing here in the wine country, gold country, in the, in the summer. The weather is wonderful. You know, I, I, you know where I started out the year? This year, in a moment of just sheer, unadulterated stupidity, I booked myself the mid-two weeks of January in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. <laughs> Friends and neighbors, do not fucking go <laughs> to Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada in January. I got off the airplane. They paid me a lot of money, and I'm a little bit of a whore. And uh, I, I regret it. I got off that plane. It was 49 degrees below. Below. Not wind chill. No, 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 no. The real thing. Both Celsius and Fahrenheit. Uh, uh, it, it's where they cross. It's, 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 it's ball shrinking cold. It's, it's, you, you don't fart at 49 degrees below zero. Why? Because you ain't letting any hot air out. That's why. If you had a dog, you'd let him out and do his business. You'd find him attached to a, to a tree by an icicle. I'm glad to be here. I've played everywhere. I played a series of one-nighters in Mississippi. I called it my anti-Minza tour. Uh, those people were stupid and proud of it. Uh, amen. Amen. Uh, I, I had a crowd. I had a crowd. This must have been six years ago, uh, my last time there. I, I just told them. I said, you people are just stupid. And this guy goes, that's right. You're damn straight we're stupid. We put the R in stupid. <laughs> There's a town in Mississippi called West Mississippi. It's in the north central part. <laughs> Honest to God. <laughs> A lot of inbreeding in Mississippi. No, seriously, there is a lot. I'm the man that figured out why that is. It's because people from other states won't fuck those people. <laughs> Think it through. <laughs> Many
many years ago. I, I did this one on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, something that I saw in Mississippi. I, there's probably a bounty on me in Mississippi. I've talked so bad about those people for so many years now. They got wanted posters, but it's spelled wrong. <laughs> They're weird. You know, you see people selling things alongside the road. They build stands and sell fruit and vegetables, etc. In Mississippi, I saw a guy built a stand alongside a freeway in the middle of nowhere selling Dan seats. That's it. Seats for a van. <laughs> Nothing else in the middle of nowhere. Oh, uh, who in the hell is the target market here? <laughs> Who's buying band seats in the middle of Is there somebody in Mississippi driving that freeway that goes, you know, Myrtle, I'm driving this here van, standing up, <laughs> you're getting to be downright uncomfortable. No, no I, I like the van. I like the van. I'm saying if I had something to sit down on, here, watch this, Merle, watch this, watch, when I gotta chip the goddamn gears. I'll tell you what, Myrtle, keep your eyes open, baby. You see somebody selling van seats, well. saw me on TV, you saw me do newspaper stories. I've always said, you know, you don't, you don't ever really have to write a joke. I got the coolest job in the world. I'm a professional stand-up comic. I make a living at it. You know, it's, 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 it's a wonderful lot. And, and, and people, you know, everybody would like to be a comic. They say, how do you write jokes? How do you continuously write jokes? And you know how you do it? You read the paper, because the, the jokes are there every day. I could write a new joke every day. But I, I just, I've got so many. Uh, so here's some for this part of the show. Call them newspaper stories. All of them old. Some of them old, some of them new, but they're all true. Uh, Brian, Texas. Uh, train jumps a track, flies through the air, lands on top of a house where there's a party going on. 25 people there and five of them die. Houston Chronicle said that most of the people in the house were caught by surprise. <laughs> no, not all of them. I mean, somebody was expecting it. Somebody got up in McAllen, Texas, and went, you know, Myrtle, you know, Myrtle, I wouldn't be a bit goddamn surprised. If a locomotive doesn't fall on our fucking head today, <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> the Miami Herald was a story about a man who got killed by a duck. He got killed by a duck. You know the number of people in all of history that's been killed by a duck is still in single digits. But, but here's how this guy did it. He's, he not only did he get killed by a duck, his buddy videotaped him while he's doing it. He's, he's on a jet ski coming down a waterway, and a low flying duck came and hit him right between the eyes and killed him and the duck instantaneously. When I, when I read this, the first thought that crosses my mind is, you know, I've always thought we die on the day we're supposed to die. <laughs> if that's so, how many ways did God miss that guy that day <laughs> before he got down to the duck? <laughs> That was my first thought. <laughs> my second thought was, ah, screw it, maybe he died because it was the duck state of God.
couple of months ago when I was working in Laughlin, I was watching CNN, and scientists said that they have proven conclusively that the AIDS virus was transmitted to humans by chimpanzees. <laughs> However, they do not know how. <laughs> I have a theory. <laughs> and one night, some, some drunk fella in, uh, in, in Arago was uh, God damn, that's an ugly woman. <laughs> But it's late, man. <laughs> I like the way she talks, you know. <laughs> hey, baby. <laughs> oh, I worry about myself. <laughs> what I did from the Tonight Show. This is an old one. It's probably still probably my favorite newspaper story of all time. Uh, uh, Brian, Texas, a body, body of a man is found. He's been shot five times in the chest with a bolt-action 22 caliber rifle. They find the weapon lying next to the body. The district attorney, coroner, and sheriff of Brian, Texas, determined this was an obvious open and shut case of suicide. <laughs> All right, let me hit the key points for you again. He was shot five times in the chest with a bolt action 22 caliber rifle. Now, for those of you out here in the park tonight that have never fired a bolt action rifle, let me give you a little quick demonstration. It's a rather unique sort of weapon and not the one that I personally chosen for suicide, but what do I know? Here's what I know. I know it's a rifle. If you picture me holding a rifle in the normal position, like I'm going to shoot that away, you'll notice a little lever right here. This lever is attached to a bolt set in a groove up on top of the rifle, which is why they call it a bolt action rifle. To operate this weapon. You hold the entire 8.7 pounds of the weapon in your left hand. Take your right hand, grab this lever, pull it up, and pull the bolt back towards you. And what this does, it ejects or throws out one used shell casing. Beep, 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 beep. You take one new 22 caliber shell, it's a little bitty teeny tiny shell, and you, you slot. Now you realize this becomes progressively harder <laughs> with three or four bullets already smack dab in the middle of your chest, okay? It's getting a little harder to do this sequence. Slide it in the little bitty teeny tiny chamber, take the lever, grab, push it forward, pull the bolt down like this. The rifle is now loaded, but it's facing in the wrong damn direction. So you got to turn that sucker around. And by grabbing the barrel and placing it here against your chest, you can reach out, stretch your arm out, hook your thumb backwards in the trigger. You are now ready to shoot yourself. <laughs> Boom! One more time. <laughs> After which, you're going to have to pick your ass from up off of the ground. <laughs> you're going to have to relocate the rifle assuming you would have dropped it when the bullet went into your chest, causing massive hemorrhaging in your lungs, you would have gone, oh, shit, and fallen down. And then, brothers and sisters, you would have to repeat the procedure until you are dead. <laughs> to shoot yourself five times in the chest with a bolt action, 22 caliber rifle, requires a degree of determination that I do not possess. Uh, I think if I shot myself, oh, you know, three times. And found to my surprise and chagrin uh, that I was still alive, I'm afraid I'm just going to say, fuck it. <laughs> fuck it. I can live with this. <laughs> I'm overreacting. <laughs> I don't want to kill myself. Good with those silver balls in that pool when he does that. Yeah.
final newspaper story that I say I'll just wrap them up. It's a John and Mary story from the Chicago Tribune. John and Mary have been going together five years when this story happens. John one day decides to break the relationship off. He goes over to Mary's apartment. He rides the elevator up. She lets him in. He tells her, he says, Mary, Mary, five years, baby. Gosh, gosh, I've, I've just learned to hate your ass. Uh, <laughs> oh, what a mega bitch you turned out to be. I, I can't believe I've stayed this long, to tell you the truth, but I've, I've had a moment of clarity, Mary, and I'm out of here. And John turns around and leaves. Mary, bless her heart, was so upset over this, cannot face the prospect of life without John, and Mary decides to kill herself. Jumps up off her couch, runs across the front room, dives head first off her sixth floor balcony, and hits John, who's coming out the front door. This kills John, and not Mary. You talk about bad luck with women. <laughs> John's up in heaven. They go, hey, John, come here, man. How'd you die? John goes, shit, I don't know. <laughs> I'm walking out the door. This bitch falls out of the sky and kills me. And the guy in heaven next to him goes, oh, yeah, let me tell you about this damn duck. <laughs> I give you a little bio. I'm going to do some uh, personal stories here for those of you. You know, he was he was really right. I mean, most comics do know who I am. I've been around since the early 80s. I started in Houston out of a, there was a group of us called the Texas Outlaw Comics. That a couple, three of us became famous. Uh, Bill Hicks and Sam Kennison came out of there. Janine Garofalo came out of there. Brett Butler came out of there. And uh, I came out of there. Uh, and, uh, but I had, I'd lived several lives <laughs> before I got in comedy. I was 40 years old when I got in comedy. So let me, let me give you a little bio for those of you who haven't read about me. I've been out of the public eye for about seven years now. Da, 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 da. Uh, start with the seminary where I was studying to study to be a Catholic priest. Uh, Woo! We'll start that. The following year, I was on a chain gang in Louisiana. <laughs> Same duel falling in with a bad crowd. Uh, <laughs> I met some interesting folk when I was on that chain gang. I, I uh, uh, stayed there in New Orleans. There was a burglar for the New Orleans mob for a while, uh, and I was still a teenager. And then I joined the Army. Uh, I joined the Army because that particular judge uh, gave me a choice. I said, I said, you drop the charges and give me a gun? Uh, <laughs> uh, so I joined the Army. Uh, the Army took a known burglar and uh, taught me explosives. <laughs> so I got out of the Army. I could read Latin and Greek, and uh, I, I, thanks to the New Orleans mob, I knew how to circumvent a, a burglar alarm system. And uh, thanks to your tax dollars at work, I now knew how to blow shit up. So <laughs> Latin and Greek really weren't that much of a help to me. Uh, but taking the other two, I decided to be all I could be and became a safe cracker. I, uh, I burglarized jewelry stores up and down the West Coast. I was the real deal. I stole from the rich, and I kept them. <laughs> they caught me, because uh, they'll outnumber your ass. Carson said, why did you go to prison? I said, because they caught me. <laughs> I sure shit didn't volunteer, all right? You know what I mean? <laughs> And uh, prison cured me. It really did. I, uh, I did three years in the California prison system at Tracy and Soledad. And uh, I turned 21 in prison out here uh, and uh, turned my life around. I, uh, uh, through luck and, and, and skill 
on some of God's blessing, I started the door-to-door encyclopedia salesman and <laughs> ended up vice president of Macmillan Publishing Company. Uh, it's not a, you know, not, uh, not your average story, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and at age 40, I quit all of that and became a stand-up comic. I uh, just basically called in sick one day. <laughs> I am sick and fucking tired. Uh, Oral Roberts motivated me to get in comedy. You know who Oral Roberts is? He's the founder and president of Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The longest running television show in America is the Oral Roberts television show. It's still on. In 1983, I was... Uh, I was uh, working for Macmillan, and I pick up my morning newspaper, and there was a headline that changed my life. I, I didn't know it at the time, but it changed my life. And that headline said, today, Oral Roberts said that a 900-foot tall, floating up in the air, Jesus had appeared to him for private consultation. <laughs> I'll repeat what I just said. <laughs> he said, a 900 hundred foot tall. It's really imperative that we all have the same general idea of how tall that is, but it's going to make the joke a lot damn funnier, all right? 900 feet is three football fields on top of one another. It is almost exactly the same height as the Transamerica Pyramid in San, in San Francisco, if you want a point of reference. A nine hundred foot tall, floating, floating <laughs> up in the air, Jesus had appeared to him for private consultation. First two words that sprang to my mind when I read this were bullshit. Uh, but, but I thought, well, the press is taking him out of context that nobody would really say that. So I wrote uh, on company stationery to Oral Roberts University and ask for their press release. What did he say happened, right? And I got it back, and, and a comedy career was born because uh, this is what he said happened. I quote verbatim, quotation marks. I turned, this was at 3.30 in the afternoon in downtown Tulsa, quotation marks. I turned around, that's how he talks, I turned around, and there he was, a 900-foot tall Jesus floating alongside the road. Those eyes, oh, those eyes, there I was, eye to eye <laughs> with the Lord, end of quote. Now, for those of you trying to picture this in your mind, let me answer a few of the easy questions for you. No, Oral never explains whether or not the 900-foot tall Jesus was thereby bending uh, way over, kind of like this, kind of like floating in a hunched over position. Or if Jesus, perchance, was floating upside down. <laughs> with his head down here and his feet 900 feet up in the air, but that would necessitate him wearing pants instead of his traditional robe, you understand? You know, what with, you know, gravity and all. Uh, or if, if, if uh, 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 Oral is a lot goddamn taller than he looks to be on TV. And, and so I, I looked that up too, okay, just to, just to be sure. And Oral Roberts is tall. I mean, he really is. He's very tall, you know, as, as people go. He is six foot, four inches tall, much taller than I am. However, quick subtraction will tell us that at six four, he is 893 feet and eight fucking inches shorter than a 900 foot tall Jesus and that counts nothing at all for the float. So, is, is this on? So, so he can't be seeing eyeball to eyeball from across the street. The angle at the apex would be a little acute. Uh, 
However, the question is not did they see eye to eye. The question is, did it happen at all? Did a skyscraper tall Jesus appear to him at that? Tell you the truth, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I thought about it, thought about it for a couple of years. When I figured out the answer, I got into comedy. There's only, there's only four things that could have happened on that day. I just don't know which one did. So I'll give you all four, and you make up your own mind, all right? Oral says a 900-foot-tall Jesus appeared to me. He'll look you dead in the eye today and tell you that. And a 900-foot-tall floating up in the air Jesus appeared to me. Possibility, amen, buddy. Possibility number one is maybe on that beautiful day in May, Brother Oral Roberts went stone cold fucking crazy. <laughs> that could have happened, okay? It happens to somebody every day. So it could have happened to Oral on that day. Second possibility is maybe on that beautiful day in May, Brother Oral Roberts had in his possession, and then went ahead and took some of the very best LSD that, that's ever come tippy-toeing down the pike. Now, I'm in Northern California. Some of you folk may or you know, have actually done some hallucinogenics, but let me tell you, in the 60s and 70s, I took some massive amounts. And while I've never seen a 900 foot tall floating up in the air messiah uh, or major prophet for my Jewish and Islamic friends, I, uh, I did see, I did see, I did see the entire Grand Funk Railroad Band come out of a record album and perform live in front of it. I saw that. I saw that. It was the third best concert I've ever seen. They did an hour and a half, came back and did a 45-minute encore. could have had just slightly better shit than I did. <laughs> That's the point I'm making here. Possibility number three. Maybe on that beautiful day in May, Brother Oral Roberts made this shit up. <laughs> Maybe he's a bald-faced liar. My personal sentimental favorite, I might add. <laughs> However, if he lied, credit where credit is due, brothers and sisters, that is one hell of a lie, all right? Balls. Ball. Oral carries his around in the holy wheelbarrow, all right? Not cojones. <laughs> I say unto thee, if thou was going to tell of them a lie, tell them a what? <laughs> Corinthians 4. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not one of the first three, and I do believe it is one of the first three, but if it ain't, possibility number four, it's true. But to be true, it's got to be true. It's got to be a 900-foot tall Jesus. If that's true, then Oral Roberts would be the hardest man in all of history to impress. Ask yourself, why would Jesus Christ grow to 900 feet tall after he just returned from the dead? He wouldn't need to show off, now would he? He was trying to get Oral's attention, all right? He knew his infinite wisdom. Showed up 10 feet tall or so, Oral shot him off. <laughs> I'm a hard man to impress. I've lived a lot. Little bitty, teeny, tiny floating up in the air, Jesus, blow my shit away. <laughs> Little 
a little anorexic Buddha put me down. <laughs> Minuscule Muhammad. <laughs> Moses, Jacob. Besides, how come nobody else in Tulsa happened to spot this nine there? Buddha? Don't seem like you missed this on your way off the book. <laughs> Say, Myrtle. Oh, Myrtle, goddammit, I'm serious this time, honey. Isn't that a 900 foot tall Jesus? Like floating alongside the road over there. Oh, what's he doing, Willard? Selling van seats? <laughs> make up your mind of which one of those four you think it is. And it is one of those four, you know. Oral Roberts said the 900 foot tall Jesus told him to raise money. <laughs> Darn, I was going for it up to then. Uh, you know, I've read the New Testament. In my life, I've kind of turned around and came back to believe in God. I've considered myself a Christian, so I go to no church. I've, my personal opinion, I don't really think the second coming of Christ will be a fundraiser. <laughs> Does that make me a heretic? I don't really think Christ would grow to 900 feet tall to do anything. It's just like really out of character, you know? But if I'm wrong, say I'm wrong on those two things, and Jesus Christ comes back to earth, of all things, to raise money. And then, let us say, that he grows to 900 feet tall to do it. Let's, let's make that quantum leap in uh, logics and theology. And so he's back here on earth, 900 feet tall, raising money. He still does not go to a right-wing, racist, warmongering, homophobic, backwards fucking preacher in Tulsa, Oklahoma, tell him to go get the money from somebody else. <laughs> 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 Jesus ain't stupid. What, Jesus will chop liver? <laughs> He'd float up outside of Donald Trump's uh, 85th floor window in midtown Manhattan and just tap on that window from the outside. <laughs> Donnie. I think you can guess who I am. And I need some money. And Trump's gonna go, you betcha. <laughs> Kinda hoping I could buy my way in. Uh, <laughs> I went on the road with that, man. I mean, I, I became instantly popular in certain parts of the country. In the South, where all these guys were from, I was popular because I was the outside voice, you know what I mean? Going, that can't be true. And uh, uh, after a while, I mean, they wanted me back to do concerts in the park. And, uh, <laughs> and they wanted me, you know, to play the larger theaters and stuff, and I didn't really have enough material, and so I, I prayed. I said, Lord God, Father of my Father, Lord of my Lords, I need a joke. And the Lord said, Ronnie, here's Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. I said, thank you, Lord. Blessed be that now. Oh, they were a gift from God. Nobody could write shit this funny. Okay. And they're back. They're like Jason from Friday the 13th, you know? They have to stick a stake in their heart. Uh, and they're rewriting history. I love it when they, they, you know, they rewrite history. For those of you who don't remember the rather sordid story of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, ministers of the Lord, uh, what people do remember is he got in a lot of trouble for going to bed with this girl named Jessica Hahn. That was the first thing that happened. And the other preachers across the spectrum acted like Jimmy Baker had just up and killed the Pope. 
They're, they're just having a conniption. You know, oh, wha how wha horrible, how what terrible, how can Brother Baker do this, how can Brother Baker do this, how can Brother Baker do this, oh! How could he go to bed with Jessica Hahn? That was their big question. Well, I saw the nude pictures of Jessica Hahn that appeared several years later in Playboy, I know damn good and well how Jimmy Baker could have. <laughs> if you didn't see Jessica, she was, at the time this happened, she was a 22-year-old, tall, long-legged, round-bottomed, full-breasted, hard-nippled, auburn-haired, hazel-eyed young beauty. Jimmy Baker had been married to Tammy Faye Baker for 19 goddamn years. Get that picture in your mind. Waking up next to Tammy Faye. That's how you start your day. In the eighth level of the seventh level, the eighth circle of the seventh level of Dante's hell. That, that little squeaky voice. <laughs> shut up! Shut me! You're a demon! Shut up! <laughs> After 19 years of Tammy Faye, Jimmy Baker deserved something else. And the joke, <laughs> and the joke would have ended because Americans are forgiving people. We would have looked at this beautiful uh, Jessica Hahn, and then we would have looked at Tammy and gone, you know, don't make a habit of it. You know what I mean? But who wants to throw that first stone? You know, not me, brother, not me. Uh, and and it would have ended right there. But then, oh, because God loves a great complicated joke, we found out that Jimmy Baker paid. Jessica Hahn for this role in the hut. He just didn't give her a couple hundred bucks. He gave her two hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars for one roll in the hay. One roll, two hundred and sixty-five, a quarter of a million dollars and some change for one time. And I could hear female thought waves just zooming by my ear. I would have fucking for it. <laughs> Girls, I would have fucked him. <laughs> I need the money. Sorry. <laughs> I, I became a, uh, a, a star in certain parts of the South that right, lost my first writing gig. Uh, for a, a radio interview I did the day that story breaks. I'm in Roanoke, Virginia, and, and I'm getting ready to do live radio, you know, one of those morning radio shows. And, and the station manager says, we're, we're very conservative here in Roanoke, and you've got to be clean. That's where you, you have to be clean on the radio anyway. He goes, well, we're very conservative, and, and so we want you to be very clean. I said, okay, all right, I'll be very clean, whatever that means. So I go in, and the newspaper's laying right there, and it, that's the headline. Jimmy Baker pays her $265,000. And it's, you know, it's right down the road from this place, and they're all over it, right? The disc jockey says to me, he goes, well, what do you think of that? And I go, I don't believe it. It's just, it's, it's too much money. I mean, there's got to be something else to the story, you know what I mean? There's, there's got to be more to it. And the guy goes, man, that, that makes sense. He goes, what do you think it is? And I go, well, Man, I have no way of knowing. I said, you know, maybe somebody's got pictures of Jimmy Baker fucking a goat. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to say it. It pops out of my mouth. They, they're just, they're going, hey, and, and I can't shut up. I go, say my name, Jimmy. Jimmy. They're going insane. The station manager is pounding on the, on the window. The disc jockey is just sliding out of his chair. But the guy that's running the soundboard is laughing so hard, he 
he is doubled over like this, he can't get to the switches. I got time for some more. Well, no sense in quitting now. I mean, these people ain't having me back, you know what I mean? Uh, this bridge is burned. Uh, I go, say it again. You cloven hooved bitch, you. Yeah. <laughs> right before we go off the air, you hear me say, oh, I love your horns. <laughs> uh, I was off the air, and NBC fired me the afternoon. <laughs> Fuck them if they can't take a goat. <laughs> I was right. That's why I didn't get sued. I mean, I wasn't right about the goat per se, but I was right about the premise. They were covering up a lot more than just a little roll in the hay with Jessica. They were organized crime, and don't ever let them tell you anything else. They stole something like $240 million, most from mostly from the elderly, sometimes their entire life savings. They were selling them the same you know, apartment complex or condo, I mean, over and over again. Uh, they were having, while they're on the Just Say No to Drugs Committee, they're having cocaine parties. They were having wife-swapping parties, but they all agreed that the Bakers were not involved in the wife-swapping. Well, <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> what do I get for jamming? <laughs> The goat. The goat's going no way. Jimmy Baker went to prison. He was convicted over a hundred different felonies. There were 16 other ministers that went to prison too. I mean, it wasn't bookkeeping. It wasn't a mistake. It was organized crime. And of these other 16 ministers, the only thing, just one final thought on the caliber of these people, the only thing that any of them ever called a press conference and denied doing, of all the things that were said about them, were said in court, the drugs, the theft, the fraud, etc. the only thing that any of them ever called a press conference and said, I didn't do that was the wife swapping with Jim and Tammy Fat. It's like, that's where they drew the line. All right, okay, all right, I stole the money. But I didn't fuck Tammy Faye Baker. Don't try to lay that shit on me, buddy. We've got libel laws in this country, mister. I was in the Army. I told you I was in the Army. 
I met a guy in the Army, for anybody, you know, in any group of people of several hundred, there's going to be several of us that have bizarre names. For those of you who think you've got a bad name, it has a worse name than you did. I met him my first day in the Army. His name was Pete Eaton. In basic training of the Army of the United States of America, when they call the roll, which they do all of the time, I might add, they call your name backwards, your last name first, and your full first name last. I was shocked Ronald, and he was Eaton Peter. <laughs> Flat cannot answer to this name. <laughs> All right, which one of you men here is eating, Peter? <laughs> See what I mean? See what I mean? Now, you don't want to be that guy, right? You don't want to be that guy. And well, neither did Pete. He didn't want to be that guy either. He had, he had no idea what, what the gods were about ready to do to him. And so, Second roll call, he's, he's so embarrassed that when they call his name, instead of answering out loud like you're supposed to, this fool raises his hand. Well, this really don't work. Starts, I said, God damn it, listen up. Well, which one of you people here is eating, Peter? I want to know, and I want to know right now who's eating Peter. Five God. <laughs> You know, some of the non-smokers are getting out of line. I was at LAX, and I was outside at the Los Angeles International Airport getting ready to light a cigarette. And this woman, this woman goes out of her way. I mean, out, I'm not in her goddamn way. I'm over the smoker's corner. And she, you know, decides it's her civic responsibility, I guess, to come straighten my ass up. And I'm getting ready to light a cigarette, and here she comes, and she gets, she goes, smoking is bad for her. I said, so is button in someone else's business. That's bad for you, too. Matter of fact, recent surveys by the American Medical Association have shown that budding in someone else's business is 17 times more fatal than smoking is. <laughs> and a lot goddamn quicker, I might add. Smoking tech decades to kill you, but in someone else's business, take your ass out to die. <laughs> Old sudden death syndrome. <laughs> uh, going around. You know. She goes, well, be that as it may, smoking is going to take years off your life. I said, I do not believe that. I don't believe that. I think you do indeed die on the day you're supposed to die. There's nothing you can do about it. On that day, you're out of here. I yeah, came to this conclusion by living 63 years and watching better men than women than me die. And I didn't. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> it ain't healthy living that got me here. <laughs> But if I'm wrong and cigarettes take years off my life, well, guess goddamn what? Takes them off the back end, okay? <laughs> I ain't lost a year one up to now. <laughs> what years am I gonna lose? 
They didn't get year 29. <laughs> oh, God damn, that was a good year. <laughs> you know what years we risk with our vices? The last 10, that last wonderful golden decade that we're all looking forward to. You know, between 91 and 100. The, the, the Kevorkian years. <laughs> Laying there in the nursing home, drooling and shitting on yourself, not knowing your name. That ten years. Fuck that ten years. smoke and don't drink and never did any drugs and don't eat this and don't eat that and do do this and don't do that. They're sure going to be pissed when they find themselves laying there in that hospital bed kind of absolutely fucking nothing. <laughs> you died anyway. Ain't that a bitch. <laughs> all that tofu you had. <laughs> didn't, didn't slow that truck down at all now, did it? <laughs> Ran right over your head. They apparently didn't know you were a tofu. <laughs> that was slow. hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but we don't get out of here alive, so lighten the fuck up, okay? <laughs> you ain't gonna make it. <laughs> if there was any chance, I'd say, God damn it, go for it, you know? But, but there ain't, so, you know, get a vice or two. I mean, don't hurt anybody, don't smoke cigarettes, it's stupid. But do something, you know. Have a drink. Do something. Get stoned. Do something. Fuck a stranger. <laughs> Eat a Twinkie. <laughs> You're gonna die anyway. That's my new motto for the millennium, okay? It's 2006, brothers and sisters. None of us are going to see those zeros roll over again, okay? <laughs> And there's a sentence that we've all heard, and you won't ever hear it again in your life. Because the next time somebody says a sentence with this phrase, we're all going to be dead. But some one time later in this century, Someone's going to say, way back at the turn of the century, that's us. <laughs> Seventy years ago, when they will, that would have actually be an apropos statement, we'll all be dead. So, have a drink. <laughs> Get stoned. Fuck a stranger. <laughs> best you can hope for is to die healthy. <laughs> Ain't that a bitch? <laughs> That's our best case scenario. <laughs> he was healthy, and then he died. Where'd it go, Bob? <laughs> Have a drink. Fuck <laughs> <Have> a stranger. <laughs> If I start drinking, I get the sequence mixed up. Have to get me off the stage. I'll eat a stranger. <laughs> I'm not fucking the twink. There has to be a line. <laughs> You don't know when you're going to die, you know? You don't know when you're going to die. 
Jesus Christ said, death shall come into me like a thief in the night. Like a thief in the night. Isn't that a great turn of the phrase? Like a thief in the night. I was walking out the door. And this bitch <laughs> fell out of the sky. <laughs> killed me. Wouldn't it be a pisser if he'd quit smoking the week before? Because <laughs> if he did, that's what killed him. If John still smoked, he'd be alive. Why do I say that? Well, he just broke up with his girlfriend, right? He leaves the uh, apartment. She's stewing about it. He rides the elevator down. She's getting more de 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 depressed. He go walks across the lobby. She decides to kill herself. She runs. She jumps. He steps through the front door. Smokers, what's the very first thing he'd do? He would stop and light a cigarette. <laughs> Squam! Yeah! <laughs> Did you see that? tell you a story. I've been, I, I, the, 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 the guy that worked for with, worked with me tonight, Clark had worked with me many years ago, and I did this story. I don't do this story once every three or four years, and I was telling them, Todd about it. So here's a story I, I haven't done, I don't think I've done in this, in this decade. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the time the Louisiana Highway Patrol shot a car out from underneath me. <laughs> oh, yeah, like it's happened to you. <laughs> I told you I went from a seminary to, uh, to a uh, chain gang, and this is how I managed to do that. Uh, uh, the seminary was, uh, you know, it was bad. It was bad. There were some evil people there disguised as priests. And... Uh, I mean, it was really bad. It was really bad. I don't want to get into it. It was really bad. And I finally just one day just said, fuck it, man. And uh, I was in Subiaco, Arkansas, and I leave the monastery, and I get to Fort Smith, and I don't know what to do, and I steal a car. And I, uh, I drive to Memphis just to get out of Arkansas, man. When I get to Memphis, my stolen car runs out of gas, and uh, I don't really know what to do, so I, I steal another car, and I... Uh, drive to Jackson, Mississippi, where I, where I run out of gas, and I, uh, I steal another car. And if you think you're beginning to see a pattern like develop here, I didn't. All right? I didn't. I was just running. And I get down to New Orleans, and I, I, I've got to get somewhere, and I, I think of this girl that I knew from grade school, that if she's moved to Houston. If I can get there, they're the kind of people that will hide me out from the law. They would do it. They would just do it. And so I, uh, I stole another car, and I head west to New Orleans. I come up over a bridge, and down to the bridge is a roadblock. And they're checking for driver's licenses. And I don't have a driver's license, but I do have a stolen car. Uh, and I got a little bit of a problem here. But, but I've got a plan. i got a plan. Matter of fact, i got two plans. i got plan A is talk my way out of it. And if plan A fails, plan B is run like a striped ass baboon. All right, those are, those are my two plans, A and B. So I pull up to the roadblock, and I'm going to do A. I'm going to talk my way out of it. I am 16 years old. I look like I'm 12. I've been up for three days. I stink to high heavens. I've got a West Texas accent. I'm driving a brand new car with New Orleans tags on it. I don't have a driver's license, and I am going to talk my way out of it. I was a little bit of an optimist when I was a youngster. So I, I pull up to the roadblock, and he comes over, and it's the real deal. This is not the movies or TV. This is the real deal in the backwoods of Louisiana with a mirrored sunglasses over and says, let me see your driver's license, boy. And I did what you would have done, the exact same situation. I pretended to look for my driver's license. I'll be a 
son of a bitch. I must have left it at home. I am so sorry, but I'm in a great big hurry. Could I like, you know, <laughs> go now? <laughs> he kind of looks at me and just a sniff at me, looks at this car, and he goes, you have the papers on this car, boy? I said, no, sir, this is my brother's car, and he needs it back right away because his wife is pregnant, and he's got to take her to the doctor, and this is the only car they've got, and that's why I'm in a great big hurry, so can I, like, <laughs> go now? And he goes, you better step out of that car, boy, right now. Obviously, plan A is a miserable fucking failure, okay? <laughs> so I decide to put plan B in effect. I'm sitting there looking at him. He kind of steps back and reaches for his gun. I look him right dead in the eye, reach up, slap my brand new six-cylinder Chevrolet in gear, pop that clutch, bam, down the road, and plan B is in effect. He runs four or five feet, gets in his brand new V8 Chrysler, and comes down the same road. And the physics of the engine size means he can go a lot goddamn faster than I can, and pretty soon I'm going down this road together with this Louisiana State Trooper. He's right goddamn there. He's right Goddamn there, I cannot shake him. It's a two-lane road. I pull into oncoming traffic. I'm playing chicken at 100 miles an hour. Cars are boom, boom, and he's right goddamn there, man. And so I drop two wheels down the far ditch, leave two wheels on the road. I'm going, this is a boom, boom, and he is right goddamn there, man. I mean, I can't shake this dude. And so desperate times bring desperate measures, and I go all the way across the road, and he is right goddamn there. They've sent a full-grown man to do this job. He's just going to run me down the next roadblock because he's radioed up ahead. So I decide to do what you would have decided to do in the exact same situation, and I decide to go ahead and kill the cop. Uh, no, it's what you would have decided to do in the exact same situation. You just don't get yourself in there. But it reaches a certain point where it's, you know, desperate times. Now, it's really hard to do at 100 miles an hour with him riding his tail and he's got a gun. But the one thing you can do is stop. It's the one thing he just flat don't expect you to do right about now. Now, it's not a risk-free proposition, I might add, but it's basically the only one you got. So I wait till there's no cars coming, and I go, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, here I come. And I just shut it down. I stood on the brake. I look in my rearview mirror, and it's worked, man. It's caught him by surprise, and he's hit his brake and turned his wheel. And if you do that at 100 miles an hour, you're in an uncontrollable slide sideways. So he slides, and I'm screeching to a halt. So I got to speed back up, real ram into mom, and I go, I got you, I got you. He goes down off the road and into the ditch. I got you, you son of a... And he bounces back up on the road. I mean, this son of a gun can drive, Jim. And I mean, he's right back on my tail again. But now, I got a highly pissed off Louisiana State Trooper back there. He didn't think that little occurrence was funny. You know what I mean? And he decides to do what I would have decided to do if I had been in his exact same situation and he decided to blow my young skinny ass away. <laughs> and I see him make up his mind to shoot me. I'm watching him in the mirror, and he leans out the window with a 357 Magnum. Do you know how big the barrel on a 357 Magnum looks? It looks about this big when it's pointing at you, okay? I mean, it's a cannon of a gun. And it's right at my head, and he goes, boom! Now in the movies, a little hole goes in, a little hole goes out, and the driver is real cool. He'll go, ooh, they're shooting at me. Well, that ain't what happens, okay? Bullet go that caliber, the window explodes. I mean, there is glass shrapnel everywhere. I'm cut all over the face. 
I'd pee on myself, just like you would have. And I'm going, he's trying to kill me. Can't take a goddamn joke. And so I start weaving down the road. I've seen the movies. I'm weaving down the road. And he leans up the window. Boom. I go, you missed me. You missed me. Boom. You missed. And here comes an 18-wheel truck, and it ain't going to miss me. Now, trucks can't dodge you. You've got to dodge the truck. So I'm going to go around the truck, and I make that move, and he had missed. He has blown out my left rear tire. And so when I make that move, my car goes into an uncontrollable spin down the road like a top, and every 360 degrees, I see a truck. <laughs> 180 degrees later, I see a very, very pleased Louisiana State Trooper. So it's going, truck trooper, truck trooper, and I'm going to die, man. And my car hits the truck, but it just clips it, and it sends me, apparently, just flying through the air. The cop told me later, it flies through the air, and it lands, wheels down the swamp. Splash! Oh, whoa! What a rush! I'm still alive. Plan B is still in effect. So I try to get the door open, but I can't because I'm sunk down in the water. So I have to jump through the window, and I jump the window, and the trees are like right there, just like this. Boom, boom, and I'd be in the swamp tree. The squad car screeches to a halt. He jumps out. Me to the, to the last sound thing right there. Across the hood, he goes, I just soon kill you as not. Boy, well, you'd be surprised how quick your mind goes. My mind said, Ronnie, that's me. This man has just hit you two out of three times at 100 miles an hour while he was driving a car, leaning out a window. And by necessity, he had to have fired those first three shots with his left hand. I had noticed in that nanosecond of my life that he was now holding the gun in his right hand, the one he's a good shot with. <laughs> The fact that I'm standing here on a stage in a beautiful park in Sutter Creek, California, 40 some odd years later, telling you all this story, I obviously said something pretty good. He said, I just soon kill you as not, boy. And I said, well, if it doesn't make any difference to you, then don't fucking shoot. <laughs> Oh my God. 